Howdy. Um, my name is Carl Lingrenstreicher, and I have gathered with some teachers who are flipping their classroom. Um, we're going to chat about a few things tonight, but uh, before we get any further, um, I'm just going to do a round of introductions. Like I said, my name's Carl. Um, I teach ninth and 10th grade world history in the Bay Area of California. Hi, my name is Tom Driscoll. I am a social studies teacher in the northeast corner of Connecticut. Hi, I'm David. I'm from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. I teach uh, AP U.S. History and regular U.S. History um, and been flipping now for two years. I'm Frank Franz. I teach in Fairfax County in Northern Virginia and i um, flipping world history, ancient world history and AP U.S. government. And I started flipping last year mid-semester with AP Gov and then this year I went all in. I'm Jason Bretzman. I teach at Muskego High School in Muskego, Wisconsin. I uh, flip AP government and politics and uh, I also teach a civics class called American Issues and taught U.S. history for about eight years before that. Nice. And we might be joined a little bit later by Elizabeth Miller, who is currently unavailable, but hopefully we'll make it. Um, so let's start with management. How do you guys manage your classrooms? What is what does the a unit structure look like? Um, how do you make sure you know where kids are and they're doing kind of the work that's required of them? Okay, I guess I can start with this one. Um, you know, I, I do a mastery style where I, t I pick eight to ten objectives typically. Um, four, eight, back up a second. Three to four learning goals. Each learning goal has a few objectives tied to it. And then each objective has uh, a few assessments that I provide. And then, you know, they do have the option to, to opt out and and uh, create their own assessments with my approval, but that's the basic structure of it. Uh, they work through at their own pace, and what I have started to do towards the end with the, the pacing issues that arise is that if students uh, finish early, like say I've had one student that finished about a week and a half early last time, um, what I did is I, I gave them two options. I actually let them start the next unit, which I was a little bit nervous about, uh, but he actually did choose that option where he's actually about halfway through my World War II unit, so I guess I'm just kind of kicking the can down the road. I'm going to have to deal with it sooner or later. Uh, but I let him just keep going. Uh, and the other option I had with the student is I said, you know, look back at your assessments. You can pick whatever assignment you want to do uh, related to the content or one of the skills, and I'll replace their lowest grade. You know, it's kind of a higher achieving student, so they did that. Uh, so that's the two ways that I'm, I'm dealing with that right now. In my class, we started off with... Um, Students as as a group uh, would choose deadlines, uh, and I would tell them there there are six learning objectives for this chapter. They would take a look at the chapter uh, and the number of pages, and I would show them the videos, and they would sort of figure out how long is this going to take us to work through this, and uh, and then I required notes from the videos, notes from the uh, the reading, and from there we had a uh, a set list of uh, topics to work through in a two, three, or four person group that they were in. So things like, um, you know, create a, a common understanding of what the learning objective is, uh, how do you relate uh, the learning objective and what you know about it to uh, current events, how do you relate it to other chapters. So they work through the stuff like that. Uh, we changed it later on because they spent a lot of time trying to figure out how long it was going to take them to, to do things. So I gave them some suggestions and and for next year, we're going to tighten that up a little bit. Uh, we, we've spent a lot of really good discussion time on things, but it's been taking us a little bit too long because it's an AP class. We've got to get there. For me, <clears throat> um, I teach AP U.S. History, and I start every day with a prompt question from the night before. Uh, it might be over the reading. It might be over the video. I would love to get to flip mastery, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to uh, with AP. I just, I guess, I haven't really found the correct way of doing that yet. And my main goal right now is just to get the kids ready for the AP test in on May fifteenth. So it more is just like on a daily basis, I make sure that they are uh, caught up with where they're supposed to be and don't get behind. Because if you get behind with AP US history, it's going to be hard to get caught up. So we test every Monday, and we start a new chapter every Tuesday. Um, but it, it's a fast-paced, and I wish I could spend more time on it, but I just don't have time uh, to thoroughly go through uh, the U.S. history the way I would like. 
because I'm kind of held by that AP standard sometimes, which is annoying, but it's the world that I live in right now, and I'm trying to figure out a way to make it more mastery-based, but hopefully I can figure that out this summer. I, I teach AP government, and, and we, f we fly, but we don't fly that fast. Uh, but, but, you know, how I, how I start my classes, you know, at, at the beginning of every, uh, every unit um, or topic, they, uh, uh, the students get uh, what we call a chapter choice menu, and it's got the, the objectives listed out, and for each objectives, there's usually uh, two choices, two activities from which they can choose, and I let them choose what you know what they want to do. And usually, what I try and do is put you know put a left brain or right brain uh, choice for them, um, and and hopefully you know one of those uh, choices or one of those uh, activities stretches them a little bit. And my AP Gov kids have have taken to it um, pretty good. And, and I don't think there's you know there's one one uh, one selection over another, um, whereas my world history kids, the, the challenge that I have is they need to be stretched a little bit more and, and pushed a little bit more, otherwise they're going to take the easy way out. And when we, when we test, you know, I, I look at, you know, I give them, you know, the, the chapter choice menu and then I don't say we're testing on X day because, you know, sometimes our units, you know, de depending on what they're working on will take a little bit longer and so I'll feel out, you know, how they're going and that's like, you know, my AP Gov kids, uh, I was going to test tomorrow with them, but I looked at it on Tuesday and said, "Okay, where is everybody?" And so we're going to we're going to test on Monday now, um, just to give them one more day of, of uh, activities. And then and then you know part of that they they watch the videos at home, and uh, and we do the, uh, um, the what I'm not clear about in class together. My kids move through units at kind of the the pace that suits them. Um, I give them kind of suggested. I'm not quite totally mastery yet. I call it mastery based. I give them suggested deadlines for various parts of a unit, um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, it, 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 there's they, they, there's check sheet that they kind of move through with. Um, I'm able to kind of figure out who's behind, who's ahead, um, and that's been helpful for me, and I think a little bit helpful for them, uh, hopefully. Um, yeah, so it's 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 more free flowing. My room is pretty chaotic, but um, I kind of like it. Are there follow up kind of thoughts to that from people, or should we move on? I'd just like to say that I really like Frank's idea of giving some options. I didn't do that in the beginning, so it was you know the sky's the limit. Um, here's a whole page of ideas that you could use to show mastery, but I think. Starting in the beginning, kind of easing them into, um, you know, here are some options, and and now start to think about what else you could do. Well, you know, what I tried to do was at the beginning I, I had the chapter choice menu, and then everybody had to do a, a mastery project, and they died on it. Uh, everybody, you know, most like ninety percent chose a PowerPoint, and mm -hmm. it's like God, you know, it's. Do something else. I mean, I, I had a whole page of activities for them to do, and I think I think I got it, uh, some of it from from you, Jason. And it, the you know, and and so what I did is I, I put that aside and said, okay, we're going to figure this out over the summer and come back to it and see what's what's a better way of of doing that for them because they just spent so much time on it and then they produced something that really wasn't a stretch. It was like, oh, you know, that's it. Mm. Yeah, see, I, I did get some really good products in the beginning. There was a significant number of students who chose to write essays in the beginning for the first couple chapters. Uh, but then there are others who they were doing scavenger hunts with QR codes, and mm. they were creating really interesting uh, quiz games for each other to show their mastery, and, and just some really creative stuff that they had done. But it wasn't everybody. And so it'd, it'd be nice to kind of work, work, the, work, work them into it, and then allow them to be creative. It's kind of one of those: give them a bunch of options, and then have kids, you know, start to predominantly choose one or two. And then as the year goes on, it's like, okay, that option is now gone. What are you going to do to show me what you know? And strangely hey. enough, that's what I did with essays. I said, you can't write an essay for the next chapter. <laughs> What teacher yeah. does that? <laughs> yeah, and that was suggested to me um, by I, I team teach an ESOL World One class, and we talked about it. And and my my team teacher says, well, let's just make you know if we do this again, let's just say, okay, if you did a PowerPoint on the last one, you can't do that on the next one. 
or for the rest of the year, you got to choose another activity. I like that. So it seems like we've got kind of a, a mixture of uh, people who are who are kind of doing the the you know use use flip classrooms to to push homework or uh, sorry what happens in class into the homework space and what happens in the homework space into class and some people who are doing mastery some people who are interested in mastery um, what are people's thoughts is it is it possible to do mastery well in I don't want to say humanities class but is it possible to do mastery the, the, does that make sense in a history classroom so I'll, I'll tackle that one first I am I really bought into the flip mastery I've been doing it for the entire year um, I think it works, but I think I need to to go a little further with it. You know, I, I think that I still need to pull back and do more uh, group discussion, more group collaboration, and, and also start out with more um, inquiry-based assignments. You know, and that's something that I think I've moved away from too much. Okay, I started out teaching government my first few years, and that's all I really did was, you know, we had group discussions and debates, and it was great. I feel like I moved away from that too much. So I, I love the idea of flip mastery. I think that there's a lot of, uh, th there's a lot to say for it. But I think some students start to work too individualized. Like, it, it personalizes the classroom, which is great. It gives them choice and control, which is great. But I don't think that they're really collaborating as much as they should. And I need to do better at making sure that they're actually doing that. Um, and some kids really love to just maybe put their, their earbuds in and, and just pound away at the objectives and just work through it really fast and do well. But how deep are they going and how much are they actually working with others in class? So that's something that I'm not going to move away from master. I still believe in it. But I have to incorporate that back into my classroom more so than, than I am right now. So, so Tom, when you, you said that you want them to collaborate more, at the outset, was that something that you laid out saying you, you should work together with, with a partner or two on your mastery project? Or, or how, how does that, that group, uh, group sense work? I let them decide on their own, and most did end up working with a group. Um, did they pick the group or did you make the group? Most of them they picked. I only had to go in and, and micromanage a couple of them, mostly just because of uh, behavior issues. But uh, I let them pick, and then I probably had a good 20 or 25 percent in every class that chose to work individually. They actually chose to go to their own little spot in the classroom and just work, and they actually did a lot. But at the end of the day, they're not learning how to work with other people. You know, so there, I think there's there's a time where I'm going to have to require people to at least try to work together, to at least try to collaborate, regardless of if they want to work on their own or not. I, I, I would suggest that you be careful with that because that's where I started out. I said, hey, it's a social studies class. You have to interact socially. It's a collaborative process. You have to do that. And th some students say, well, but, man, if this is about me learning the way I learn best, and I learn best by not talking to other people. I learn best by talking to you and asking you questions and reading the book and taking the notes and organizing it in my own mind. Well, that was a tough uh, thing for me to you know, say, well, but that's not how it's supposed to be. Twitter, Twitter told me it's not going to be that way. You know, so uh, We're at a point now where um, I have two students because that's the way they learn best. We're, they they're learning by themselves now you know at some point I got to bring them back in we're going to discuss this as you know a big group but um, man I resisted that for a long time because I had my idea of how they were supposed to learn which is how we've been doing it for you know a couple hundred years I guess yeah when when my students are working on on their activities I, I too at the beginning thought, all right, they're going to be doing this individually, so let me go visit with each one. But as I, I found, you know, as, as the class evolved, you know, you've got little clicks or student, and, and I don't mind if, if, if my kids move around uh, and work with kids they're more comfortable with um, as long as they're productive. Um, but what I found was the, the discussions with the kids about what they, what they were learning as a group, I think, were richer as opposed to... Um, as opposed to individually because, you know, you know, what I do is I just go up and I say, okay, what'd you learn? And, you know, and some kids kind of, you know, they, they're kind of hesitant, um, but usually if there's one kid in the group that starts it off, that gets the other kids going. 
And so I, I think it's it's a I think it's a good tool. And then you know I, I think I'm going to keep it um, because I think it works. Absolutely. I'm not going to lie. I, I, just let me really really quickly add that I I think it's about that balance you know between the the individual and the group. I I don't want to say you know don't don't do both those things, but um, a proper balance is important. And I'm not going to lie, I'm a little afraid to go flip mastery totally just because of, I'm afraid to lose the, the group discussion. Um, like Tom, how you were saying a little bit. I, that My class is all based around discussion for the most part, and I'm afraid to lose that with them. And maybe that's me just having to get over that fear a little bit because we do work in pairs, we do work in groups almost every other day. But uh, I want to start most days out in a group discussion and break off from there. I'm afraid that if I go completely mastery style, that I'm going to lose that. <clears throat> well, yeah, you know, I, you, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Carl. No, I didn't. Tom, your your concern about where you are and David, we know what you're saying really resonates with me. Um, or resonate, resonate, whatever. Um, <laughs> because that that was a concern. I mean, I I want kids working together, and they self select into groups where they're kind of at a similar place. They're talking to each other when they get stuck. Um, but I I, I mean, I guess you know it's it's not entirely self paced because every unit I I carve out time and I try to have one structured academic controversy that we do together as a group each unit and then one Socratic seminar that we prep for for a day or two and then do um, each unit so that there is that time to kind of intentionally build knowledge together so I mean they'll have a chunk of you know two or three weeks of kind of work days to get through the kind of meat of the unit and then towards the end of the unit to give kids time to catch up who were a little bit behind or something like that um, then, then we move into more synchronous work where, okay, everybody's working for a couple of days now to prep for this thing or everybody's working on kind of figuring out what happened with this event. And so that's kind of a, been my kind of trade-off to, to deal with the concerns that both you guys addressed about losing that richness of conversation in a um, flip mastery environment. You, you know, to follow up what, what David had said about the concern, that doesn't mean that you can't just schedule in a, a day for group discussion or, or half a period for group discussion. And I don't know how long your periods are, minor 90 minutes. Um, so, you know, I think you can insert that even into a mastery model and still be successful and still keep your group cohesion and, and yet your individual, you know, your individual uh, identities uh, or your work while, you know, while they're doing that, that mastery, but then say, okay, you know, today, you know, say, okay, on Thursday, you know, here's what we're going to do for part of the period. So, you know, prep for that by doing X, Y, and Z, or don't prep for that because we're going to do, you know, B or C. David, what, I, I'm curious to, I mean, you talked a little bit, were there other people that wanted to follow up because I wanted to push push on one of the things that David said? There you go. Um, David, you had talked a little bit about you know wanting to have that beginning of class discussion, despite the fact that kids are kind of in different places in the unit. Have you have you figured out a way to kind of make that work away for that 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 would make sense that they could talk about something that was relevant to everybody in the class, even if they're not exactly in the same spot? Yeah, I mean, every week I just kind of map out the big ideas for each chapter in AP. And I put them on the back board, and every day, Monday might be two ideas that we that we just do a quick prompt over to make sure that they're on the right idea and they're understanding the big ideas of that. And so they know on Monday or Tuesday what the big ideas are going to be for each day that we're going to cover. So if we don't, if we if we do have a group discussion, it's going to be over one of those ideas that we can expand on and go into more in depth detail. Um, over the course of the day, or the next day, or the, or that whole entire week, it might be. So it just it depends on day to day for me because I, I realize I move at such a fast pace, and I don't like how fast I have to move, but I almost I'm forced to. If that makes sense. If it helps, I I do current events with my kids every day. That's how we start the class. So for the first 10, 15 minutes. Um, you know, in, in AP Gov and in, in world history, you know, the, for the world f history kids, it's the world focus. For the AP Gov kids, it's the U.S. focus, and that's you know, the, the, we, that's the time we spend together, and then then we go to the winds for most of the time. Yeah. And I've done the the whole the current event idea, and it, that works. And 
Sometimes for me though, that kind of gets off gets us off topic and off task a little bit because sometimes I have kids that just want to talk about like tomorrow we're going to talk about the Pope. I can tell you that right now, and uh, we're going to talk about that for probably fifteen or twenty minutes because there's about four or five kids that were big into that today and they're going to want to discuss it again tomorrow. And I'm okay with that, um, but I just want to make sure that I'm covering the right the correct things with them on a daily basis. Yeah, I I had that uh, issue in the beginning with AP government years ago, and so I I took that out of the uh, of the classroom and I put it on the blog. So each week uh, the AP government students have to blog about current events, so they get that that conversation, but they get it online outside of class, talking about current events. Here's one thing that I was just thinking of. It seems like you know a lot of uh, a lot of the standards, no matter what standards you're using, whether it's state or, or Common Core, or whatever, they seem to all be shifting towards skill development and a lot of uh, and away from content. So I was thinking about just the nature of my videos themselves, you know, and I was looking at the the objectives that I have, and really only two or three out of the eight or ten in the unit are are strictly content based, like content acquisition. Um, and I'm thinking that next year, or even this this quarter, really putting a heavy emphasis on on making tutorials or videos that walk them through social studies skills. And I've tinkered with it, and it's something that that I, at the end of the day, think if, for instance, if they could find a content lecture or content video on, say, ancient Greece online, like they could use mine. They could also find a lot of other ones out there. But I think it, the way that I w want them to say, for instance, analyze a primary source in my AP Euro class, that's something that I really think I should put on video and, and make like a quick instructional uh, tutorial on how to do that. And I was thinking if any of you guys have tried that uh, or are, are thinking of doing so in the future, because that could be a great collaborative thing that we do together is, is try to create a library of, of skill-based social studies tutorials. When my kids were, well, before we took our first free response question, which... In, in AP government, that's the essay. Um, I, I made a, a few minute, five minute video on how to answer a free response question. And I, you know, I had my kids watch it. And then, it, then I told the other, my other AP government teachers at my school, I said, Here, you know, here's what I did. Feel free to throw this to your kids or not. And so, it, so I think, you know, they, they took it and they said, you know, that works for me. So they just showed it in class to their kids. Can you share that link? Yeah, sure. Let me uh, let me dig it up. That'd be great. I do the same thing with AP when we're doing the DBQ and the FRE statement as well. I always uh, make a quick video and I go through writing a thesis statement and analyzing the documents and things like that. So that has been a huge help for my kids as well at the beginning of the year. I'm glad you brought this up, Tom, because I've never really thought about that. I mean, I, I've explained every year. I explained this year how do you write a free response question, how do you go through and take the test and eliminate the wrong answers and all that kind of stuff. Never even thought about making a video, but it makes sense, doesn't it? All, all my videos are content. My, uh, the, the, I share kids with uh, <clears throat> an English teacher and um, we do a lot of kind of, uh, we have a, a two-year curriculum where we're kind of building writing skills. and. Um, she has made some videos about the the different parts of a, a critical paragraph and of of kind of good writing that um, I think have been really useful. I mean, they're posted on my walls with QR codes, and kids are occasionally checking those out. So I think that that Tom, you were talking about kind of history specific skills. That's more of a humanity skill, but um, I think those have been useful, and I think it would be good, especially in an asynchronous environment for me, where you've got kids who are, you know, well, I'm uh, looking at this document, and one of the things. I have to be looking for is you know bias and perspective bias and what do I think I'm going to see you know having a having a, a library of videos about that I think would be super useful. And I think for the AP classes there are specific things for each AP class. You know for AP government you're not writing a thesis, you're not writing an introduction and conclusion, you're not doing DBQs, but for AP US you are. So it would be it would be a, a lot of videos about a lot of different really useful skills, I think. Yeah, and you know, I looked online to find one that just got it just succinctly, and I couldn't find it, so I, I put the, the link up on the on the chat side, um, and it's 
three minutes, 42 seconds. Really straightforward, no BS. Great. There's okay. another reason that got me thinking about this, too, is we just had a faculty meeting where we're trying to um, align all of our writing assessments to Common Core. And yeah, it's a lot of, it was a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, I think that that's something where, if, like, say a district like ours just said, all right, well, we're going to decide this is how we're going to approach, this is how we're going to write an argumentative essay or whatever we're going to choose. And we just create some instructional videos or, or it's just something that the whole district or at least the teachers that are working on that can use. And I just think it would help, um, you know, it would just help collaboration between teachers, you know, that, that we're teaching the same thing, that we're using the same resources. Um, so I just just something to think about, especially as we start having to tailor a lot of this to Common Core, and then if, if they ever do come out with history Common Core, uh, then I'm sure we're going to have to start aligning to that at some point. Um, Tom, but as of now, we're, we're st we have to do the the reading and writing standards anyway. But until the the history ones come out, we're going to have to consider that. Tom, are you suggesting that the, uh, that's something that this group should work on? Making I'm suggesting that's something this group should work on. <laughs> <laughs> well, as as a, one of the states that has opted out of Common Core, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can count Frank out then. Yeah. Well, I'd you know, be more than happy to review and give feedback. <laughs> there, there, there are books, you know, thinking like a like an historian that you know you could mm -hmm. go there and, and there's some, you know, a process that you could take students through in, in that regard. Yeah, I know, Carl, you do a lot of work with with that too, right? Like the idea of teaching them to to do the work of historians. You know, that's something I don't do enough, and I'd love to see. You know, some some more step by step how to do that. You know. Yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a Sam Weinberg disciple. Um, I, yeah, I think it's it's a good way to get kids into or try to get them into as much of the gray area of history as possible. Because I mean, for me, and you know, this is heretical to some people. Um, the, you know, the skills are so much more important than the con or yeah, the skills are so much more, than, right. more important than the content. It's like you know, let me give you just enough content so you, you can go and do the critical thinking with it. Um, and I think that's actually one way that you know, as I've as I've moved towards the mastery model this year, I've just cut out a lot of fat, and it's like, you know what, I'm going to teach to a unit question and forget some of the content standards that they don't fit my unit question. I'm not going to throw it on there just to throw it on there because it'll be this artificial addition to a unit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's something I try to do, and, I, yeah, I would definitely be interested in, in creating some sort of a library for that. Oops. There we go. First awkward pause. Um, are there things that uh people that what what are there other things kind of the the what's next of what we should talk about? We talked a little bit about the beginning of the class stuff. Um, how about, how about what we're maybe struggling with, or what you know what we found in the middle of the year that we changed or are are going to keep, but then you know mix it up for next year. I could get my. I've got kids in my room right now. I could get them over here. They could talk a lot about what I'm struggling with. But do it. Yeah, do it. Yeah, do it. Bring them over. Oh man. Turn, just just turn the camera around. Hold on. Uh, I need to see yeah. if I need to see if they want to do it or not. I don't want to put them on the spot. You guys can chat about. Make sure they sign a release first. <laughs> right. Well, no. They yeah. They do that at my school. Why don't you guys chat about what you struggled with? And man, talk about authentic audience. I don't know if I'm ready for this. <laughs> All right. Since I brought it up, here, here's what I'm struggling with. Um, I had to stretch my students. And mainly my ninth graders over my twelfth graders, um, because again it's a standard world one class, and they 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 be more than happy to do the worksheet three sixty five, and you know that's just not where I want them to go. You know maybe start at the worksheet level and then okay let you know let me stretch this out let me do you know let me try and do an infographic on you know on, you know on, on Constantinople on the Byzantine Empire or something, um, but I. For the most part, I only have one student who who's, who I can let go, and he will stretch himself without any prodding. In fact, he asked if he could, and I said, "Yeah, just go." And, and I guess during the uh, he he knew so much about the the Rome stuff. Um, I think he spends most of his time at home on the History Channel or something. And uh, and I said, "You know, the the objectives that we're doing, just stop that that stuff. You know this. Go find something interesting you don't know about, and then come back and tell me about it." And so so you know what I, again. I'm, what I'm struggling with is how to stretch my ninth graders. Well, I'm guessing that they've been conditioned to do yeah. that worksheet for, you know, however many years. Uh, and 
so it's it's got to be a process, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have well, to. My kids are the exact same way. They've been told what to learn, how to learn it, and when the test is on it, and that's very hard to um, break that habit off of them. And then my first month and a half is usually a lot of just saying, you know, we're just going to learn what we learn and go on that way because I don't always tell them what's on the test and they get very upset with it. But uh, over the by usually by mid October by Halloween time, it's uh, I kind of broken them of that uh, condition. Um, I, I think one one thing that's come up quite a bit with me is, you know, I get some students that that are very high achieving, and I know they're just sleepwalking through the first couple weeks of the unit, knowing that they can race through at the end. And I'm trying to get them to just maximize the time that they have in there. And I even tell them, look, if you want to just get going, get this done before everyone else, and, and fly through, then I'll come up with some fun options for you to do, or or you can work in other classes, but. I can see they're already, even though it's a new concept, they're starting to play the game a little bit. So I, I'm going to have to rethink, um, you know, the whole concept of pacing and trying to keep them motivated and not penalizing them for for doing well and going through the objectives fast. They don't say, okay, you're done the objectives. Here's another assignment, you know, because they look at that and they they a lot of them, whether it's right or not, they see that as a penalty. So something for me to reconsider moving forward. Yeah, the the twenty percent project that I'm working on this year has been has been useful for the folks that get done early. But the problem is, though, that you know, were you to work fifty minutes every class period in my class, it would be truly a twenty percent project. But I mean, it, it's hard for kids to go from a teacher center teacher centered teacher paced environment to an environment where um, where where they're in charge of the pace that they're learning at, and if they want to make the choice to, you know, talk to their friend for a while in the class period, it's like, well, you made that choice, but now, you know, that that time that you were going to have to work on your twenty percent project, um, you know, that that kind of disappears. And so that's one of the things that I have been bothered with this year. Um, Tom, just this unit in terms of getting stuff done early, I offered kids just because I had a lot of kids who were like, you know, there isn't a due date. I'm not super concerned with getting stuff done, you know, by the required time. Um, I'm offering them 10% extra credit if they demonstrate mastery on the content at the end of the unit. Um, and that's actually motivated some kids. I had a kid done two weeks early um, who just finished a unit that, you know, he should have quite a bit more time on. So we'll we'll see how that goes. But this is about mistakes. Um, and my, my kids were not super thrilled about coming and talking to the, the YouTube world. But um, I think, you know, that, that jump... You know, they said it seemed like I had to teach myself when we went to the self-paced environment. I think that 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 that's hard. That is a hard jump to do. And I tried to to scaffold that process of going from, you know, hey, we're going to work on stuff together to okay, you're kind of in charge of getting help when you need it. And and I think that I needed to do a much better job of being very clear of like, you know, just because I'm not standing in front of the class every day, like it, it's now your job to get me to teach in kind of the, the way that you're used to it when you need it because I'm going to assume that you're okay if you're moving through the unit and I'm not hearing from you and, and kind of the work you're doing is up to par. So I think that was one of the things that that I didn't transition through as well as I needed to is that, that release of kind of total control of the, the learning that they're doing. I, w I would add to that uh, what I... What I learned is that I need to teach them how to do what I do when I'm not there because my students are all working in groups and so when I'm there I, I'm really teaching more and better I think than I did when I was just telling them stuff and broadcasting it to everybody and lecturing because I'm asking so well what if this happened and well why is it that way and where did it come from and and how did it end up like that and so we're having that conversation and they're answering these questions because they know stuff. Um, those some of the most rich conversations and discussions have happened when I've been teaching, you know, with that small four or three person group. Uh, but there's the other group on the other side of the room that I don't know if they're doing that all the time. And maybe they don't have to all the time. But I need to sort of teach them how to ask each other those questions and. Uh, and I did it a little bit, 
uh, but probably too late and not enough so that they can sort of carry on that conversation when I'm not sitting there with them. Because I think that that's what it's about, right? That they're in charge of their own learning. They should be questioning each other. They should be questioning themselves even. Right. For you guys that are doing the mastery side, how often are you guys doing the direct instruction to maybe say the entire class or just to like a small group of people that are struggling with one certain topic or content area? Does that happen daily or is it weekly or what? It really depends uh, on what they need. If I'm going around to the groups and, and finding that, uh, whoa, we all got this misconception of what this means, then I'm standing up in the last 10 minutes and saying, okay, let's stop and all look at this together. I don't think I did that enough this year so far, but but that's how I'm doing it. And it might happen twice a week. It might not happen for two weeks. Yeah, I mean, for, for, go ahead, Tom. Actually, you saying that just made me think a little bit of, of Ramsey's model, the ex Explore Flip Apply, because even though you didn't actually use a video for it, the fact that you waited for them to have the misconception and then you gave them the direct instruction. I mean, Carl, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that a big part of that, that model? Um, so I think that we could do that, even though the video itself isn't the flip, but maybe the flip is the direct instruction where, like, all right, that's when we provide it. You know, so because I'm still, I, I my videos in the direct instruction are still front loaded. You know, that's something where I want to change that a little bit moving forward. And back to your question, David, about about when do I do the direct instruction? Typically, it's it's through the video lectures, but also in class, it's I always do a warm up, followed by mm -hmm. some type of direct instruction. So the warm up can be different every day, but I'll still go up there and I'll talk about it and I'll give them some type of of instruction in the first five ten minutes of class. And then they're off. And we have shorter classes. We only have 15-minute classes. Uh, we don't have block scheduling. Hey, Tom, when you, when you said you were going to change where you put the videos instead of front-loading them, where, where would you put the videos? Well, uh, I think the whole concept behind, the, behind Ramsey's model, and Carl, you probably explain this better than me, but um, like if I were do, to do a skill-based video, I would right. maybe let them try something. And then if they needed it, then I'd require them to watch it. But for instance, if it was about persuasive writing and they tried it and they did great on it, I wouldn't need to have them watch a video on it because I know they already know how to do it. Okay. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, it does. Chances are they're going to need, or someone would need it, but not everybody. So right. in a way, you're just saving the kids that could just keep going from having to sit down and watch you on a, an instructional video because they can do it already. Mm -hmm. I have ideas on teaching an entire unit, um, my South Africa unit, which is the last six weeks of the year, using Explore Flip Apply. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I think some kids like the asynchronousness of, um, of the mastery model. Uh, but the kind of the way I see it is with South Africa, there's so many, you know, you've got to get across the, the horribleness of apartheid. So, I mean, I think you start with, you know, I think it would be a lot of images and songs and, you know, looking at pictures of apartheid and the, the laws and the rules. And, I mean, we've, we've talked about imperialism already, so they have kind of some of that schema around control tactics. So, I mean, I, I think you start with, you know, how did white South Africans control black South Africans? And you get as much from them as you can in terms of the way they use the the videos, or excuse me, the way they use the the images and the you know the the, the words from the laws, um, and then move into okay, you know these are the things that you missed. This is the misconception, and that's where the a, a video could come in around um, around content. Um, and I'm not, I still don't know. I pardon me wants to offer an asynchronous option and an explore flip apply option. For the last unit, um, and I might do that. It's that would be a lot of work, but um, I think it would be cool to try to do because I think that you know letting them get to a point where, okay, this is what I think I know based on you know the 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 inquiry work that I did, and then see what they kind of fill in the holes that they missed, and then move into kind of a new, more novel way of looking at the, the at what they've kind of uptaken. Um, I think it would be neat, but yeah. I'd, I don't know. I'm, I'm torn as to whether or not that's how I'm going to do that last unit. I mean, do you guys think that the explore, flip, apply model or, or approach would even 
makes sense in humanities. I know that Ramsey does it in science. Um, but do you think our kids really just need that foundation, that context, and, and that direct instruction from us in the in the front of the unit before they can even engage in a a, a high order inquiry activity? What do you guys think? Uh, maybe not in uh, U.S. history because they probably have some basis, you know, for it. But I think definitely in government and politics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, well, if I had to label it, I do flip, explore, apply, create, because they're, they're watching the video and, and reading the book outside of class, and they come to class with what we call IQ interesting questions, you know, something, hey, I don't know about this, but I want to know about it, and then they talk about that, sort of, that's their warm-up, that's their starter, uh, and then they apply it, where they connect it to current events, they connect it to other chapters, they connect it to the vocabulary, uh, and then they create something to show that they've mastered it. Um, so, I, I don't know. I, I think you got to have some knowledge first in order to explore something. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think it's it's a clean shift from the sciences to the humanities with with uh, explore, flip, apply. And I, I like Jason's idea, um, and uh, you know, I'd like to see it fleshed out more. But I agree that you know so our kids have some background in some of the topics, um, but but I think a lot of it they just lose along the way. It's like my kids, um, like like the U.S. history teachers, they they have history in elementary school, then again in the seventh grade, then again in the eleventh grade, and you speak to some of the U.S. history teachers, it's as if they have not had U.S. history. Um, so I, I don't know. I, th I think they do need uh, I th they need something up front. Um, to either you know remind them of what they learned before, or to say you know here's something here's something interesting, um, you know a launching point. Yeah, I've really struggled with what a what a whole unit would look like with Explore Flip Apply, but I think with a place like South Africa, there's enough rich imagery and sources that you could give kids a legitimate question to do during the Explore phase, in a way that I think it would be difficult when there's so much content to cover. I mean, how do you create, you know, an explore, an, an explore phase to learn how World War I battles were fought? Because, like, World War I battles, the tactics were stupid. It was just a giant slaughter. Um, but I think that, I think that with the South Africa unit, you can pose problems and have kids think about answers to those problems and those questions without doing direct instruction first. And I, I think that kids would be able to do a lot of that thinking on their own. Um, but I don't know, that's just my two cents. 